Good morning, everybody. As we continue the fight against the coronavirus, we take a moment today to reflect. Today is World AIDS Day. We reflect on the decades, the decades-long fight of the AIDS pandemic. We reflect and we mourn those we lost. So many New Yorkers lost someone dear to them to HIV and AIDS. We reflect on the fight, the amazing struggle, the activism, the grassroots voices that stood up and said, the government has to do more. And we reflect upon the extraordinary efforts of our healthcare leadership, all those trailblazers and innovators who found new approaches to keep people alive and keep them safe. And we've come a long way. And it's a reminder of our ability to fight back even against extraordinarily difficult odds. And no place felt that more in the AIDS crisis than this city. But let's also appreciate how far we have come back and that we can now talk about ending the epidemic once and for all. So today, it is a reminder of the crucial role our public health leadership plays in protecting us. Hearing those voices of the people and finding solutions and approaches that will really help to guide people, to educate them, to give them the tools to protect themselves. And we have, throughout the coronavirus crisis, turned to our public health leadership for guidance, for strategies, even though for all of us, including the most learned medical professionals, we're all dealing in many ways with the great unknown when it comes to the coronavirus. Nonetheless, our healthcare leadership has helped us find solutions and a way forward. So today we're going to talk about the moment we're in now, and it's a challenging moment. We are fighting with everything we've got against this second wave bearing down on us. Uh, but we have the tools to fight back in so many ways. And we particularly have to remember what we learned in the spring about who is most vulnerable and the special precautions that need to be taken when it comes to our seniors and folks with pre-existing conditions. So we today are gonna to make very clear that uh, new measures need to be taken to protect those who are most vulnerable. And our health commissioner will be issuing a public health notice to make clear the standards that we have to hold as the second wave bears down on us. Here to tell you about it, New York City's doctor, our health commissioner, Dr. Dave Choksi. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. And what you described is indeed what we're seeing, a marked increase in cases uh, as well as hospitalizations due to COVID-19. This escalation unfortunately follows a tragically familiar pattern. Cases grow, hospitalizations follow, and sadly, too many result in critical illness or even death. Hospitals have reported more than 1,100 COVID patients. That's twice as many as were hospital hospitalized less than three weeks ago, and the highest number since early June. Every one of those hospitalizations represents a person fighting to recover, a livelihood interrupted, and a household distraught. I know this because I've seen it with my own eyes. I remember the concern that I felt for my own primary care patients earlier this year, particularly those who are more susceptible to severe illness. I think about my young Dominican patient with type 1 diabetes and my older Bangladeshi patient with emphysema. And I know that some people face a much greater risk for severe illness from COVID-19. This includes people who are older or have underlying health conditions like cancer, heart disease, weakened immunity, obesity, sickle cell disease, diabetes, and others. These factors greatly increase the risk of poor outcomes and even death. That's why today I'm issuing a commissioner's notice that warns at-risk New Yorkers about the growth in COVID and that urges appropriate precautions. That means stopping non-essential activities, staying in as much as possible, and avoiding social activities outside of your household. We'll be working with partner agencies, with community-based organizations, doctors, and others to distribute this notice. But there's one thing that I wanna to say to all New Yorkers. 
A risk factor does not alone determine risk. Whether or not you are a senior or have one of these conditions, COVID-19 can infect you. It can cause serious illness uh, and sometimes long-term symptoms and could spread from you to others who are at even greater risk. To invoke the great Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., we are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. And with that same historic lens, today does, does make me take stock of another mystery virus, which a generation ago was fast spreading and about which our understanding changed by the day, HIV AIDS. At that time too, there were people who stepped up and changed the world. And so on World AIDS Day, I'd like to recognize what those heroes achieved in our ongoing fight against HIV. We are close to ending the HIV AIDS epidemic. We must learn from that experience as we continue to hone our response to COVID-19. Foremost is the notion that it takes a whole community to beat back a pandemic. That's why the commissioner's notice that I'm issuing today is just one step. We need you to carry the message forward to help protect at-risk New Yorkers. I do wanna conclude, Mr. Mayor, with one final appeal to New Yorkers. While I am discouraging non-essential activities, medical care is essential, both for COVID, that includes testing for COVID, as well as for other conditions. Whether for diabetes or depression, it's important to keep seeking routine care and to go to clinics and hospitals when you need to. It is safe. That includes getting the safe, effective, life-saving vaccine that we already have, the flu shot. It still may be the most important one you ever get. Let's all roll up our sleeves for this next phase in our pandemic response. Thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Everyone, look. What you're hearing Dr. Choksi say is we need you. We need you if you're older, you have pre-existing conditions, to take additional precautions. We need you. We need you to go out and get that flu shot if you haven't done it already. And we need you on another absolutely crucial mission for this city because we need to keep people alive. And that is not only uh, an issue when it comes to fighting the coronavirus, it also is so crucial when it comes to anyone who ends up in the hospital at a moment literally of life and death and needs a blood transfusion. We need to make sure that that blood supply is there for all New Yorkers, any New Yorkers who need it in their hour of need. And people constantly ask me how they can help. I can't tell you how many times I've heard just everyday New Yorkers saying, I want to help, I want to do more, I want to help us over this crisis. Here's something everyone can do. You can give blood and it makes such a difference. We have seen a marked decrease in the blood supply because of course there haven't been corporate blood drives and blood drives at colleges and all the things that used to, government offices, the things that used to make such a difference. But we have to come up with uh, another way now and it's gonna come down to every one of you who can help helping out. The current blood supply is down to just a few days just a few days. This is really a very, very urgent situation. So we need you. We need you to lend a hand or more accurately to lend an arm and give blood. Everyone, the New York Blood Center uh, is leading the way as always. New campaign, Give Blood NYC, helping us to understand how important it is and how easy it is. And the goal here is to get 25,000 New Yorkers to give blood this month, 25,000 people this month, so we can get that supply back up. And the good news is not only is it the right thing to do, not only will you help save a life, and you're gonna feel great inside that you did something so good. Not only will you get a cookie and a juice box, one of the great fringe benefits of giving <laughs> blood, but now you have an opportunity to also win some great prizes. The blood center is working with us and a lot of other great people to make this something that is life-saving, but also a lot of fun. And I'm talking about real good prizes. Uh, notwithstanding the travails of the New York Jets season, you could get coach club tickets, coaches club tickets to the home opener for the Jets next year. Uh, you can get a VIP tour of the Empire State Building and 
uh, Dr. Choksi, do not listen to this prize. Free Krispy Kreme donuts for a year. That is not approved by the health department, but the rest of us would really like that. So anyone who wants to be a part of this great contest, you can go to nybc.org and sign up. And here to tell you about what it really means and, and to talk about the extraordinary work of the folks at the Blood Center, who we depend on. They don't get the credit they deserve, but we depend on them every day. The president and CEO of the New York Blood Center, Dr. Christopher Hillier. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. We're greatly appreciative of the mayor's leadership in working with his office towards this new campaign of Give Blood NYC. As he said, we need about 2,000 donations a day and 25,000 additional donations this coming month. This next wave of COVID and the weather and the holiday season makes it very much more difficult to collect blood. Typically, we do so in office buildings, churches, synagogues, schools, university, all basically closed. We need you to come out to our fixed site centers at nybc.org on our website, make a, uh, a donation plan and a time and appointment. During COVID, all people still go to the hospital with trauma, mothers delivering babies, babies who are premature, surgeries, cancer patients, all these patients need blood. So we very much appreciate the mayor's leadership in this. We look forward to working towards these 50 prizes that the mayor talked about and that those will be chosen 10 every Monday morning and handed out to people who sign up. Sign up at nybcnewyorkbloodcenter.org, nybc.org backslash Give Blood New York, New York City, Give Blood NYC, and then go on our website, nybc.org, to make an appointment. We need very much everyone to come out at this critical juncture so that we don't move from critical shortage to dangerous shortage. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hillier. And again, thank you to you and all your colleagues. And really want to make sure people understand there's a lot of folks looking out for us every day uh, who we don't get to know so well, but we really need to thank the folks who work at the Blood Center, do so much for us. We're going to hear from another special guest. And she is an educator who serves our kids. And if she was just here to tell you about her life of helping others and helping uplift our children, that would be powerful enough. But she's here to tell you about what it means to be someone who got one of those uh, blood transfusions, what it means to be someone who really needs that help. And so you can feel the impact of what you're going to do, what it means humanly to be there for your fellow New Yorker. So my pleasure to introduce a great educator, someone we're so happy to have with us, Shatira Weaver. Welcome, Shatira. Thank you, Mayor de Blasio, for inviting me here today to help support this very important effort in collaboration with the New York Blood Center. I am Shatira Weaver. I'm an educator at the Metropolitan Expeditionary Learning School in Queens. So a real quick shout out to all my students, all the love to you. Hey, y'all. <laughs> um, in addition to being a public school educator, I am a sickle cell warrior, and I'm one of the many New Yorkers who regularly rely on the donation, the voluntary donations of blood. In fact, just three weeks ago, I faced a sickle cell crisis, which is both unpredictable and very painful when it occurs. One of the main treatments for sickle cell is a blood transfusion. I'm almost immediately invigorated and emboldened after a blood transfusion, given the influx of healthy red blood cells that my body normally doesn't produce on its own. I swear it's like spinach for Popeye. Every, every single time I feel immediately better and without it, I would, have been, I would have had to stay in the hospital and remain there for an indefinite amount of time. Thankfully, I was able to receive two blinds of life-saving blood transfusion because of the, the generous donations of New Yorkers who have already donated. But unfortunately, COVID-19 has put a real strain on the blood supply, and that scares me and other sickle cell warriors, but not just us. Blood is needed for cancer patients, accident victims, mothers experiencing complicated births, just to name a few. We all need you. That's why I am so excited about the Give Blood NYC campaign that the city is launching. Uh, this campaign can help me, essential workers, and countless other New Yorkers get through the holidays and get to see a new year. I became an educator to make a difference in the world and to help people. 
and you can also make a difference. You can help New York City remain strong and stay strong. If you are healthy and able to give blood, I am asking you, please, please do so. You can also make the world of difference in not only blood receivers, but their families and friends alike. We need healthy New Yorkers to donate blood. So thank you again, Mayor de Blasio and the New York Blood Center for helping to ensure that despite this pandemic, New Yorkers like me continue to receive the life-saving blood that we really need to survive. Thank you so much, Shatira. And thank you for telling your story because it really is powerful and reminds people this is such a beautiful and important thing you can do for your fellow New Yorker. So I want to thank Shatira, thank Dr. Hillier, everyone who's doing this good work. Thank you to all the folks who are donating the prizes, the companies and the folks who are really stepping up to make it uh, something so appealing for New Yorkers to get involved. But really, we need you. So we're going to start today saying we need 25,000 people for the month of December. We're going to keep giving you updates to remind you uh, how we're doing and how much we need. But everyone, you're going to feel so good after you give blood. Maybe not as much as spinach to Popeye, to use that great analogy. But you're going to feel good because you're going to feel in your heart that you did something so good for your fellow New Yorker. And imagine just that, that few minutes of your life could save someone else's life. So please, everyone. We need you now. All right, let me go to our daily indicators. Uh, and again, this is another day where we have um, some uh, results that are lower than recent days, meaning the number of tests that we are relying on is lower because we saw a reduction around the Thanksgiving weekend in the number of people being tested. So we're going to give you the numbers, but with a bit of an asterisk that uh, they're based on a lower sample size than usual. Okay, number one, daily number of people admitted to New York City hospitals for suspected COVID-19. Threshold 200 patients. Today's report, 132. Confirmed positivity rate. That continues to go up. We're watching that very carefully. 58% now. A number two, new reported cases on a seven-day average. 550 cases is the threshold. Of course, far beyond that now, 1,685 cases. And number three, percentage of people testing citywide positive for COVID-19. Threshold 5%. Today's report, 5.72%. So that's a daily report, and again, based on a lower sample size, but obviously something we're very concerned about. The more important number, even though also affected by uh, lower test numbers recently, lower amount of tests recently, but still a number that we are really concerned about, 4.14%. Let me say a few words in Spanish. Este año, nuestra ciudad ha enfrentado desafíos muy difíciles y juntos hemos salido adelante. Hoy tenemos otro desafío, la falta de sangre en nuestra ciudad. Y ahora debemos responder para seguir salvando vidas. Donar sangre es el mejor regalo que nos podemos dar a los unos a los otros. Por eso, vamos todos hoy a donar sangre. With that, we will turn to our colleagues in the media. And please let me know the name and outlet of each journalist. We'll now begin our Q&A. As a reminder, we're joined today by Dr. Choksi, by Dr. Christopher Hillier from the New York Blood Center, by Dr. Mitch Katz, and by Senior Advisor Dr. Jay Varma. And for, Shatira. And by Shatira. <laughs> uh, the first question today uh, goes to Katie from the Wall Street Journal. Oh, oh, hey, good morning, everybody. Uh, how are you doing? Hey, Katie, how are you doing today? Good, thanks. I, I'm just curious. I know um, you kind of added that asterisk to the daily indicators today. Do you know why there are, I, I just said for an explanation for those watching, um, why is it a smaller sample size? Is it a different methodology for taking this information? Or what has changed, I guess, I've heard of the last few days that there's a different um, smaller sample size. Sure, I, it's the holidays. It's uh, from Thanksgiving Day through the weekend, just fewer people getting tested um, because of, you know, being involved with family activities or whatever else it may be. So we expect those numbers, they are starting to go back up again, but we had uh, several days where the numbers were uh, noticeably lower. The number of people being tested were noticeably, meaningfully lower than uh, previously we had seen. Go ahead, Katie. Um, 
Great. Uh, and, and my second one is um, just about with the hospitalizations increasing. I know um, the city has been prepared, I guess, for what could be a second wave at some point. But if uh, I don't know if, if someone, Dr. Katz or Dr. Trotsky, wants to speak a little bit about the city's preparation, um, especially now with there's larger advisories to the elderly and those with pre-existing conditions, just some of the preps being done. Yeah, that's a very, very important question. We're putting a lot of uh, focus on that. Uh, obviously, uh, we've been working closely with the state, and uh, the plan the governor put out yesterday is something we were involved in over uh, the last week, uh, working on with the state. Uh, but the city, uh, the public hospitals, H and H, have been preparing now for many weeks for this possibility. I know the hospitals in Greater New York uh, Hospital Association have as well. So, Dr. Katz, why don't you talk about uh, some of the ways that you have been preparing? Uh, for these additional cases uh, and what you are doing, obviously, based on the lessons we learned uh, from the spring. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. So, uh, as you say, we've been working on this uh, for the last several weeks so that if there is a major increase in cases, uh, we are prepared to handle that. Uh, right now, people should know that Health and hospitals, our ICU is only about two thirds full. So we have a third capacity, same on the regular medical surgical wards. And we're not overwhelmed at any of our 11 hospitals. I've talked with my colleagues at health uh, through the Greater New York Association and all of the hospitals are right now prepared to take more patients if we need to. Um, in, or, in terms of preparation, what we've done is first, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, you made sure months ago that we had three months of supplies for all of our uh, personal protective equipment, what people call PPE. Um, we have more than enough ventilators. We purchased a group over the summer. Uh, so equipment is a non-issue for us at this moment. We are well prepared. We have prepared a number of spaces to be able to take care of people who have COVID by adding HEPA filters into their rooms, creating negative pressure rooms, which suck the air out and thereby suck the virus out and protect the healthcare workers uh, from infection. We've added cameras and uh, audio monitors to a variety of rooms so that uh, patients uh, can request things from their nurses, their doctors, without anyone having to enter the room. If there are things we can answer questions or provide without putting anyone at risk, uh, we want to do so. We've learned a lot about how to take care of this disease, uh, providing people who are short of breath steroids uh, makes a huge difference in shortens hospitalization. Uh, which is undoubtedly one of the reasons why we are not overwhelmed despite the growth of, of cases um, that we've seen. We've learned that uh, patients do not all need to be intubated when they become short of breath. Many people can be cared for better by giving them a high flow of oxygen and thereby saving um, intubation only for those patients who absolutely need it. So it's a combination of preparing our facilities and being able to better care for patients so that we do not become overwhelmed. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mitch. Go ahead. The next is Bob Henley from The Chief Leader. Yes, uh, Mr. Mayor, um, I just wanted to ask you, why should uh, members of Congress from districts and states poorer than New York vote for a billion dollar bailout for New York City, New York State, and the MTA, when this state has been refunding back to Wall Street billions of dollars in rebates of a tax it had on its books since 1905, but stopped collecting in the 1990s. I think that some of them in stack estimates, it's worth $19 billion a year, and that in the last decade alone, we've sent back $138 billion to the Goldman Sachs crowd. Okay, Bob, I want to flip that. I'm going to answer it, but I just want to, I think I would order it a little bit differently. The first point is New York City and New York State send so much more money to the federal government than we ever get back. And that's been happening for decades and decades. For God's sake, Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan used to do an annual report on how ridiculous the disparity was going back to the 70s and 80s. It continues to be uh, an unacceptable disparity 
we send so much out, we get so little back. So for the uh, federal government, for the Congress to approve a stimulus, to help the whole country back on its feet, to help the whole country recover humanly and economically is the right thing to do. New York City is one of the leaders of the national economy. Helping us back on the feet, our feet helps the entire country. And I say it again, helping us back on our feet helps the entire country. That is why the Congress should pass a stimulus. It's the right thing to do. It will spur on the economy. It will help people to survive these tough times. Also, we deserve our fair share. We've never gotten it for half a century or more. We should get uh, our fair share of resources. It's long overdue. But you also point out something really important, Bob. Are we taxing the wealthy enough? No. The answer is simple, no. Uh, the wealthy are doing better and better during this pandemic. It's a shocking truth. You look at the stock market, you look at how the rich have literally gotten richer while everyone else is suffering. It was unacceptable, the status quo before pan the pandemic. It's worse now. There need to be higher taxes on the wealthy. The stock transfer tax totally should be reconsidered and handled differently going forward because clearly Wall Street can afford to contribute more to New York City and New York State. Uh, so your question is very, very fair. I just think the ramifications are much broader than that one tax. I think Washington needs to help us because it's the right thing to do on many other levels as well. Go ahead, Bob. So since the early stages of the state's public health crisis, Governor Cuomo has urged that public hospital systems like H&H &H and private hospitals uh, operate as an integrated unit. Why shouldn't that be the model going forward since we know that the pre-existing fractured system resulted in so many poor people falling through the cracks in terms of the care they were getting? Well, Bob, again, you ask a good and, and big question. I'm gonna to turn to Mitch, because he's obviously on the front line of this. Look, I think that the core of your point is right, that uh, we need to see as much of a team effort among our hospitals, and that those hospitals that happen to have more resources should uh, be in the work of helping uh, patients with the greatest need. We did see, to be fair, uh, some amazing teamwork during this crisis. When H&H &H needed help, um, Hospital for Special Surgery stepped up, Memorial Sloan Kettering stepped up. I wanna thank them for really uh, being there and working in that team effort. And it wasn't because of an order, it was something that they wanted to do to help each other out. But I think you're right, going forward, there's more ways to think of the whole hospital system as uh, a team effort. So Dr. Katz, you wanna to speak to that? Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I think it's a wonderful point that we are stronger when we work together, when we level set across all of the hospital systems. And that's very much the plan going forward. We're also going to uh, be working actively with the fire department to allow patients to be transferred uh, across borough lines if necessary, when uh, part of the challenge we had in the first uh, wave was that Queens, Central Queens was so disproportionately hit that it was difficult to transfer patients beyond um, any hospital in Queens because all of the hospitals in Queens were full. So we're looking at much more as the city as a whole resource, as all of the systems as a whole resource, and I think that will make us stronger. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. The next is Sean from The Daily News. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Um, wanted to get a, ask about the the commissioner's notice. First of all, when you when it said that it applies to older New Yorkers, can you put like a more specific number on the age you might be talking about? And also, can you put the notice in context? Is this you know going to what what happens after this? Should this be interpreted maybe as leading up to broader stay at home orders like we saw in the spring? Um, I'll have the commissioner reiterate. Uh, who he is focused on, who is in greatest need right now and most vulnerable. I think, uh, Sean, to the bigger question, we all have to work really hard right now uh, in every way. The, most, the smallest ways like wearing a mask and practice social distancing and uh, the bigger ways in terms of people uh, not hosting bigger events and really making sure to keep people safe uh, and protecting our elders, protecting people with uh, pre-existing conditions. We have to do all those things. We have to do them intensely. Uh, if we are not successful in driving down these numbers soon, of course there's the real possibility of much greater restrictions. So we have to do this work individually if we want to avoid those restrictions. 
Dr. Choksi, you want to go over again who you're focused on? Yes, sir. Thank you. And thanks for the question, Sean. Specifically in terms of age, what we know from the science is that for adults, um, the older one is, uh, the greater your risk is. So people in their 60s are at higher risk than people in their 50s. Uh, same for folks in their 70s, 80s, et cetera. The commissioner's notice um, specifically refers to people above the age of 65 because we do see a significant um, increment in risk uh, for seniors who are, who are older than 65. But remember, it also includes uh, people who have um, other conditions that put them at risk to, uh, to have the severe outcomes that we're really trying to prevent that lead to hospitalizations and, and more catastrophic outcomes as well. Go ahead, Chant. Yeah, thanks for that. I also wanted to ask about uh, testing for students. I understand that pre-K and kindergarten students don't have to submit COVID testing consent forms. Could you and maybe Dr. Toxie explain the rationale for that and say if there are any other measures being taken to assure the safety of, of pre-K and kindergarten kids specifically? Yeah, Dr. Choksi can talk about uh, the reality we've seen with kids that young because it obviously is different. Go ahead. Sure, Mr. Mayor. Um, so w w the, the rationale for um, thinking about testing differently among younger kids is that we know the risk of transmission uh, is lower uh, among younger kids. Um, this isn't to say that you know, there aren't situations where they may need to get tested. Uh, it's still possible for um, a younger child to get infected with COVID-19. Um, and if they develop symptoms, uh, you know, they should certainly get tested as well. But in terms of what we're doing with the more uh, routine uh, testing in schools, that's the rationale for the difference. Go ahead. Pardon, uh, next is Marsha from WCBS. Good morning, Mr. Mayor uh, and Dr. Choksi. Um, uh, I have more questions about the, the, the your directive for seniors to stay inside. I wonder, um, are you going to provide any special services helping seniors get food, helping seniors get to their medical appointments, um, anything that they might need so that they can find staying inside um, the safer alternative? I'll start and turn to Dr. Choksi. Uh, Marsha, look, food right now, absolutely. We've had that from the very beginning. Any senior who cannot uh, get food themselves or have someone bring it to them and needs it delivered, we will do that for them for free. All they have to do is call 311. That has been from the very beginning of this crisis. I've said we will not let any New Yorker go hungry. We will not let any senior go hungry. Even if it means delivery right to their door, we'll make it happen. In terms of medical appointments, I, I've spent enough time around Dr. Choksi to know he's going to say one, one of the only exceptions to what he's saying is to make sure that people get the health care they need and that that is uh, something sacred to make sure folks stay in touch with their medical professionals and uh, we will do anything we can of course to support uh, seniors and folks with pre-existing conditions who who need that uh, help connecting with health care go ahead doctor that's exactly right uh, mr mayor L let me um, just take a step back to emphasize that uh, the commissioner's notice is um, specifically about avoiding non-essential activities. Um, that means that essential activities, whether it's um, you know, someone uh, going to the grocery store occasionally, um, or as the mayor said, you know, someone going to their medical appointments, which are very important, um, those, uh, those can and should uh, continue. Um, but it's uh, non-essential activities that we really want to see uh, curbed and curtailed as we um, see cases uh, and now hospitalizations, you know, starting to increase. Um, with all of that said, yes, we need to do everything that we can as a city, but also as uh, neighbors, as family members, um, to support uh, people uh, who are more at risk. Uh, so that includes, you know, the food delivery programs that um, the city has, has set up earlier and, and that continue. Uh, throughout the pandemic. Um, there are ways to ensure that you have support, whether it's for um, transportation or getting uh, medications um, delivered to you or are prescribed in a more convenient way. Uh, you can call 311 for assistance uh, with those services as well. Um, and then the final thing that I'll just say is that 
another essential activity is um, getting care for COVID-19. So if you are feeling symptoms, uh, you should get tested uh, as quickly as possible. And certainly if you're feeling even worse, um, you should seek care with your doctor or at an emergency room. And one other obvious uh, point, which has really changed a lot, Marcia, in the course of this crisis is the use of uh, telehealth. And Dr. Katz, uh, I'd love you to jump in here. I know that it's something obviously health and hospitals used before, but we've seen in the crisis uh, many new ways of using uh, telemedicine, uh, much more willingness of your patients to engage it. Uh, this is also a crucial way you can help uh, seniors and folks with pre-existing conditions without them having to leave their home. So Dr. Katz, you wanna speak about that? You're absolutely right, Mr. Mayor. I see many of my primary care patients these days who televisits, especially if they're older or have comorbidities. And we've learned a lot about sending people uh, blood pressure cuffs, sending them oxygen saturation meters, uh, sending them home with uh, glucose testing kits uh, so that people can actually do many parts of the exam. And I know that it's not just health and hospitals that seen this explosion, the providers all over New York City and all of the hospital systems are prepared to see people in televisits with just the telephone. So people, if you're worried that, oh my goodness, I don't, I don't know how to use a laptop, I, I couldn't possibly, that's okay. The phone works quite well in most cases, um, but for people who have the ability to use a laptop, um, we can also do televisits. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead, Marcia. So, Mr. Mayor, a few uh, weeks ago, you predicted that um, December 1st would be the day that, or the, the demarcation of when there might be uh, more orange zones um, or red zones or yellow zones, actually, in New York City. I know you've seen the numbers continue to rise. The numbers are rising today. Do you have any prognostication about whether once the Thanksgiving um, numbers come in in the next seven days or so, uh, whether you'll see more mini cluster zones and um, restrictions in New York City? Look, this is something uh, I've been talking to the governor about. Our teams are talking constantly. The state obviously is focused on you know, a micro cluster approach uh, that's had a lot of impact uh, clearly, and it's been effective in many cases. So I think what we're gonna see is the state looking at the different areas in a targeted way. You look at the zip code data for the city that we put out, we see very different realities in very different parts of the city. But I certainly think there will be some more restrictions coming if we continue to see these numbers. I don't have any doubt about that. I can't tell you exactly how and when, but I you know, expect more to come. And again, if I know, I, I don't even have to say if, I know New Yorkers want to avoid more stringent uh, restrictions. We all have to do everything we can do right now to uh, do the hard work to avoid those restrictions. That includes getting out there, getting tested, wearing a mask, all those things that Dr. Choksi has been telling us to do, people have to be really devoted to that now, uh, or else we are certainly gonna see more restrictions going forward. The next is Ruvain from Hamadia. Good morning, Mr. Mayor. I would like to follow up with a question about uh, special ed students. You said yesterday on CNN that the middle and high school would not be opening until the new year. Uh, there are, I know District 75 will be opening soon, but there are special ed classes in these schools, uh, not in District 75. Are these students going to have to wait till the new year or will the special ed classes be opening earlier? It's a very important question, Ruben. I appreciate it. I can tell you this much. With District 75, we made the decision to do the opening across all grade levels. So I want that to be really clear uh, because everyone agrees. All of our stakeholders, the state, the city, everyone agrees that uh, kids with special needs, the, the in-person support is absolutely crucial. So District 75 schools will be open across all grade levels. Uh, your point is a very good one. And we are looking right now at how quickly we can reach uh, special needs kids at the middle school and high school level. I don't have an answer for you on that today, but we'll come back with that soon. I also want to emphasize our goal is to open up middle school first as quickly as we can. I think realistically, as I've said, that's not in the next few weeks, but I do think uh, that's in January. And then after that, to go to high school as well. But we need the testing capacity, since we're much at a much higher level of testing under our new plan. 
We need to make sure we can do that first properly for District 75, Pre-K, 3K, and K to 5, and then we can build out to middle school next and then eventually to high school as well. Go ahead, Ravain. I have a question for the doctors. I've asked in the past about antibodies when they might be recognized as uh, uh, people being immune and uh, perhaps giving allowances to, to these people um, just as if they had a vaccine. Uh, generally, the answers I received or that, you know, we don't have complete information. We're eight months into this pandemic. I'm wondering, is, is there some point at which we might have some more information and people with antibodies might be treated like people with the vaccine eventually will be treated? Dr. Shashi, you want to start? Sure. Um, thanks for that question, Ravain. Um, I would reiterate, uh, you know, what we've said about this in the past. Um, the science uh, has not uh, changed with respect to being able to say um, that someone who has had a positive antibody test uh, should act any differently um, than someone who has not had a positive antibody test. Um, the way that we think about antibody tests is they are tests of exposure and not necessarily tests of immunity. So most importantly, continuing to do the things that you would otherwise do, wearing your mask, um, making sure that you're uh, distancing, washing your hands frequently, uh, et cetera, those things all uh, continue to apply. I do hope there will come a point where we understand more about immunity to COVID-19, where we can say things with more certainty about who is uh, and is not protected. Um, but with a vaccine on the horizon, I think that is the most likely um, destination, the most likely point at which we will be able to say that with more certainty. Dr. Varma, you wanna jump in on this? Uh, I think the only other point I would make is there was a question about timeline, and I just want to make the point I, we are all impatient and would love to have valid information right now, uh, but eight months when it comes to understanding a new disease is actually a relatively short period. So we would love to have definitive information, but it is almost certainly going to take more time. Yeah, and Dr. Varma, I think you would actually do a service to everyone because we're all still trying to recognize reality. We never heard of this disease a year ago, basically. Um, what is the typical timeline, just to give people some perspective? Yeah, you know, what we're seeing right now is science moving at an incredibly fast pace. And, and even though we're all impatient, this would normally take years to, to answer this type of question. Um, and even then, there would be still some uncertainty. And that's because of a simple fact. When we want to say, how long are you protected, you can't speed up time. And the studies that you do in laboratories um, really don't give you a sense of how the body is going to maintain its immunity over time. We're still learning things, for example, about measles, uh, which is a virus that we've had a vaccine for since the 1960s. Very, very important point. <laughs> Thank you, doctor. Go ahead. The next is David Cruz from Gothamist. Hi, good morning, Mr. Mayor. How you doing? Good, David. How you been? Good. Uh, thanks for taking my questions. Um, so uh, the first question is, the Archdiocese of New York filed a lawsuit against the city claiming that the city is violating state law by not offering Catholic schools the same free COVID-19 testing provided to public schools. So why did the city file the appeal if there's a state law in the books that would grant Catholic schools the same access? Uh, we believe the law is clear that it is not the city's obligation to provide the actual testing uh, service. Our lawyers have looked at this carefully. Law department has handled this from the beginning. Look, I've spoken to uh, Cardinal Dolan about this. Um, it's something I fully understand, the, the fact that um, folks in other school systems uh, are urgently trying to protect their kids. I appreciate that. I know they are dealing with all the challenges we are. They have limited resources, but our obligation right now is to continue the process of uh, having New York City public schools be open and healthy and safe. We're, we've got a huge number of kids to serve. Uh, we need all the resources that we have right now. What we're describing now, this, this weekly testing is going to take a huge amount of resources. It's the right thing to do. It's taking our gold standard we started with in terms of health and safety in our schools and adding even more. And it's what's going to sustain us but it takes an immense amount of resources. Uh, so the law is clear uh, that our obligation is to ensure that the facilities we run, uh, we're providing the testing to. 
for uh, the other types of schools, they have an obligation, but we'll help them. The Department of Health has been there for them the whole way through. We'll help them get the free test from the state. We'll help them uh, learn the best ways to implement it. We'll give them a helping hand every time we can. Go ahead, David. And then uh, your office hasn't released a racial demographic data of students who've opted for hybrid learning. So when can we expect to see that data? Um, if that data is uh, collected in that fashion, I don't know the history, honestly, of Department of Education providing uh, demographic data. But if they have it, we'll make sure it gets released soon. But again, I, I want to be careful because I'm not sure how that is handled in generally, excuse me, in general. But look, the bottom line here is uh, remembering that our school system is about 80% kids of color. And obviously, uh, in comparison to private schools and religious schools, uh, New York City public schools overwhelmingly uh, provide support for more kids who are working class and lower income, uh, more immigrant kids, uh, obviously a huge number of kids who tragically uh, are in temporary housing. Um, when we put the open opportunity out there for parents from the original surveys in the summer on through to the different opportunities to engage uh, blended learning, it has been an absolutely uh, available choice to all parents. And I want to emphasize this. I care deeply. My, my whole public life has been focused on the issue of fighting disparities. But I also want to really respect each parent's choice because I'm a parent too and I understand our public school parents. We many times have said to parents, this is what you feel is right. Whatever you want to do is what we will support. And we've made that open opportunity available from the beginning and obviously with the most recent opt-in period. And I think everyone who cares about disparity also has to respect the individual choices of parents who know what's best for themselves and their kids. Go ahead. We have time for two more for today. The next is Abu from Bangla Patrika. Hello. Uh, hey, hello, Abu. Can, how are you? Hey, Abu. How you doing? Good. How are you? Good. Okay, Mayor. Uh, my question is um, the since the COVID wait, we need a little more volume. Can we get our volume up there? Abu, can you speak a little bit closer to the microphone, please? Abu, can you hear us? I think we're going to have to come back. Unless we may have lost Abu for now. We'll get okay, back. Okay, you'll come back in a moment. Okay. The next we'll do Arthur from Fox 5. Good morning, everybody. Mr. Mayor, I was wondering, since you've been collaborating with the governor on approach here, what can you tell New Yorkers about the original plan of 10 days above 3 uh, above 3% uh, or 5%, I forget what it was, that, but needing those 10 days before uh, some more severe restrictions. Is that still currently the plan, or could there be a scenario where the numbers go up so quickly that that plan is set aside and, and those uh, those restrictions have to go into place more urgently? Yeah, Arthur, I mean, obviously it's important you ask the state directly. Um, we've had a number of conversations with them over the last few days. Uh, everyone's focused on uh, health and safety and also obviously focused on people's livelihoods. We're really aware of how much pain uh, folks have gone through this year and how you know many, many families are struggling. Working class families, low income families that need employment and small business owners. So we're trying to balance all these factors. As I said, the state obviously has focused on a micro-targeting approach. I think that's where they're going to be continuing uh, to focus. Uh, as to the numbers, again, that 10 consecutive day number is something they've used up to now. I'm not sure that's how they're going to continue to do it. Uh, but we're, we're going to continue to talk to them to figure out the best way to, to balance all these pieces. Go ahead, Arthur. The other question is on street safety. There was a car um, after midnight on Monday in the Bedford-Stuyvesant section of Brooklyn that went through a red light and slammed into a car. I don't know if you saw the video, the, the woman in the back seat of the Uber that he T-boned. Um, the car was hit so hard that she ended up outside the vehicle being ejected from it. The driver, um, as is often the case, was not cited. 
for anything and allowed to go home. Police say that they're investigating it. Given the fact that she's in critical condition in the hospital, uh, that he was seen on video camera speeding, uh, going through a light and hitting that car, do you think in a year where we're seeing 15% more traffic-related fatalities that this uh, there's a better message to send to drivers who drive rec- recklessly in our streets and leave other New Yorkers in critical condition, if not worse? Yeah, Arthur, look, first I want to be clear. I want to make sure I get the exact facts of what happened happened. But the broader point you're making is something I feel very strongly about. There's not clear enough, strong enough consequences in the law for drivers who hurt their fellow New Yorkers or even kill their fellow New Yorkers. The law is still, I'm talking all law, city, state, federal, everywhere. It's still too deferential to the automobile and the automobile driver. And especially if someone's under the influence and they harm someone, there needs to be real penalties for that. So I don't know the f- specifics, and I'll find out right away. Um, and if it, something wasn't handled right here, we'll obviously make sure that that's addressed immediately. But I think the bigger point is, I think we need stronger laws, harsher penalties, honestly. And it's something I've worked on with the NYPD. I want to see the NYPD constantly improve its enforcement and follow through. There have been a lot of good work by NYPD to make Vision Zero come alive. It never would have worked without NYPD, but there's still more that we can do to tighten up enforcement. I'm quite clear about that. Go ahead. Do you have Abu back? We're going to go back to Abu. Hi, how are you? Good, Abu. Okay, sorry that it it was interrupted. So my question is, uh, you know, the the, uh, South Asian community, their involvement, the the COVID is increasing... uh, Every mosque, they have, uh, yes, I'm, uh, hello? Yeah, Abu, you're skipping in and out, but keep talking. Let's see if we can hear you. Yes. Hello, did you hear me? Yeah, keep talking. Okay, yeah, so the, uh, there is the, uh, every Friday, the mosque has a lot of congregation. The, the Muslim community, they're coming in the mosque, they are praying. So do you have any, any, any kind of guidelines for them? that because of increasing the uh, disease and when the people are coming to the mosque and, uh, um, you know, uh, some people there expressing the concern, do you have any suggestion for them? Yeah, it's no, it's a very important question. Thank you. I'll turn to Dr. Choksi, but just say everyone needs to be mindful about uh, the precautions we have to take, especially indoors, especially in colder weather where more people are indoors. And it all begins with the use of masks, especially. This is the, such a crucial piece of the equation. But I want you to reflect on what Dr. Choksi said today, that if someone is older or has those pre-existing conditions, being really, really careful not to do anything they don't have to do. Um, and if they can worship uh, at home or worship separately, there's so many virtues in that. So Dr. Chox, you want to speak to that? Thanks, Mr. Mayor. I, I think you covered the major points. Um, I'll just add a couple. Uh, first, you know, I want to acknowledge that um, COVID-19 has affected South Asian communities in New York City uh, significantly, um, particularly uh, in parts of, of Queens, which is where, uh, where I live in Jackson Heights and where we know there are significant numbers of, of neighborhoods with many, um, many people of South Asian descent. Um, part of this is, is related to the topic uh, of, of this morning, which is that uh, uh, COVID-19 has more severe effects on people who have uh, chronic conditions, diabetes, heart disease, high blood pressure. Uh, these are things that we know occur more frequently among South Asians as well. And that's why it is so important to follow the precautions that we've been talking about. I'll just reiterate um, the ones that are the most important. Wearing your mask uh, at all times, particularly indoors. Uh, if you do choose to, um, to worship uh, in a mosque or a temple, uh, it's important to keep your mask on when you're doing that. It's also very important to maintain six feet of distance uh, and practice good hand hygiene. Um, and then most importantly, uh, you know, for people to stay home if they're not feeling well, because that is how we know uh, this virus sp- spreads among people. Go ahead, Abu. And second question is, the uh, president said the uh, vaccine could distribute by December, but as he mentioned that the New York will not get uh, the vaccine um, because of his kind of uh, reservation. Do you think it's going to be in 
impact on the New York state and city people, the president, uh, because of the president decision? Abu, it's a really important question, and I'll let um, Dr. Chaksi and Dr. Varma speak to um, the conversations they've had with their healthcare colleagues on the federal level. I, I would remind you that President Trump, even before he lost the election, constantly threatened New York City uh, and other cities. You know, he said he would send in uh, federal troops and officers. That didn't happen. There would be these massive ICE raids. That didn't happen. He would cut off our funding. That didn't happen. Sometimes the court stopped him. Sometimes it was just words and campaign bluster that went nowhere. I do not believe that the responsible elements of the, the federal government are going to not send the vaccine to the biggest city in America and the place that was the original epicenter of the crisis. I just don't believe it. I, I think people are bluntly uh, starting to transition right now to the new administration and, and doing what is the right thing to serve people and not listening uh, to uh, the ever more desperate voice of President Trump. So I think that's reality, but let me have the doctors speak to it because they're closer to the situation. Go ahead, Dr. Choksi. Yes, sir. I, I agree with your statement. Um, you know, stated simply, uh, I believe that New York City, um, as well as New York State, will get the COVID-19 vaccine uh, at the same time that others around the country uh, will get it. And that's once the FDA uh, has, um, has determined that it passes muster, that it's authorized that we do have a safe and effective vaccine. Um, our, uh, our conversations with uh, our federal counterparts, both at the CDC as well as the Federal Department of Health, uh, have all been very uh, productive. Uh, they occur very frequently, uh, certainly on a weekly basis, sometimes uh, even on a daily basis. And similarly, we're in close contact with our state counterparts uh, as well. And so everyone at all levels of government are working closely together to ensure that once we do have a safe and effective vaccine, which we hope will be uh, within weeks, um, that that is uh, delivered to New York City as soon as possible. Dr. Varma, you want to add? Uh, I'd only just echo exactly what Dr. Chakshu said and, and that we also are professionally colleagues of many people who are on the um, COVID task force to the president-elect team and can, can reassure you that uh, these are all highly seasoned expert professionals who are fully committed to making sure that New York City um, not only gets the vaccine but distributes it as quickly as possible. Thank you very much. Everyone, as we conclude, look, uh, I'm going to just end where I started uh, very, very a poignant day, World AIDS Day, but also a day that reminds us of the power of people to fight back and reminds us that the voices of the people matter so much here. Uh, we've learned in this crisis, again, how important it is to go to the grassroots, engage the people, educate people, get them to be part of the solution and the fight back against the disease, today being the coronavirus. And the people in New York City have responded so powerfully but we also have learned how important it is to invest in the ways we support people, and that means our public health system, whether it's Department of Health, whether it's uh, Health and Hospitals, or Test and Trace Corps, including the Take Care Initiative that we talked about yesterday. All of these investments have helped us to survive and now fight back against the coronavirus. And um, I really want to emphasize that we keep learning this lesson over and over that the investments that we make in public health are both morally the right thing to do, but end up saving lives and stopping so much needless loss of life and destruction to our lives and our city, our economy. So we're going to keep making those investments, and we intend going forward uh, to show this country and this world what it looks like to have a city that is focused intensely on public health and to be that public health capital of the world, the place that not only experienced this, uh, this pandemic at the epicenter in this country, but also took the lessons, built upon them, and now can teach others how to fight back and to avoid these kind of challenges in the future. That's going to be so much of the mission of New York City in the future. So we've got a challenge right now with the second wave bearing down on us, but we will defeat it. We will have that vaccine soon. And then we get to the work of this city recovering and this city becoming an example to everyone else of how to persevere and prepare for the future. 
Thank you, everyone.